do you uh, do you intend to run samples from any of the Martian meteorites through your instrumentation suite? Uh, not through our flight instrument. Uh, we're trying to be just really fastidious about what we put in there, uh, so that we don't bring any of any unwanted stuff to Mars. What we're in the process of building right now is what we call a test bed. It's a nearly identical experiment that we can put into a Mars chamber. And yeah, that will be a, a really interesting experiment to run. We run Mars meteorites all the time with this type of processing in the lab. We have, for example, Murchison samples and so on. And our analysis isn't as, as sophisticated as obviously as some of the laboratory analysis we can do. So it's really interesting to compare what our relatively simple evolved gas experiment, what it turns something like Murchison into compared to, you know, these very sophisticated liquid extraction experiments that we also run in the lab. Okay, but yeah, you. once we get our test bed set up, we'll also be running uh, meteorites through the test bed. Yeah, I link it to what you were saying. You, you were mentioning the sample return era, but do we really believe that uh, um, laboratory on, on Earth can spot something that a sophisticated, uh, uh, let's say, robotic laboratory like yours could not spot? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's, uh, <coughs> you know, a big drive in, in the uh, community of scientists interested in Mars to bring sample back. And even with all the sophistication we're trying to put into this uh, experiment, there's no way we can do the, the whole suite of analyses, the range of analyses that we could do in, in terrestrial laboratories. Uh, those laboratories, of course, are way ahead of the curve in terms of capabilities of what we send to Mars. And so, you know, one good thing about sending a, a sophisticated lab to a site on Mars, if you find something really tantalizing, for example, a complex, complex, then that might be a real prime spot to send a sample return vehicle and, and return sample to Earth. Of course, that's expensive, you know, uh, five or more billion dollars, and uh, hopefully it'll happen one of these decades. It's been on the books for, for quite a while, and uh, just because of the cost, is very difficult to get off the ground. But bringing sample back to Earth will not just increase the possibility of uh, biological contamination? Yeah, and that's something that uh, people think very hard about as well. Uh, there, we're developing tools to really sterilize and have very, very clean acquisition tools, keep the tools that collect the sample totally isolated from the environment, pull out a tool, for example, a core, core out a piece of a rock, and then put it back in the sealed container. And then there are all sorts of international uh, agreements that say, don't bring back things to Earth that might potentially uh, be of danger, a different type of microorganism to Earth. So the outside of this container that returns to Earth will have to be very, very sterile. And then the sample would have to go into a containment facility and looked at inside that containment facility. And then only if we found out that it was benign would uh, it be distributed to other labs. Okay. And I think I'm getting the signal here. So thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. That was great. Um, our next speaker is Clank. Our next speaker is an old friend of the Mars Society, actually a founding member, um, Dr. Chris McKay. He's an astrobiologist at NASA Ames. Chris has done analog work all over the world, Antarctica, Siberia, and the Canadian Arctic. Of course, he's been active, you know, up at the Flashlight Mars Arctic Research Station. Being a